The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. Well, we'll go ahead and get started with our last activity then. So first of all, this is where you ask students, who is Dolly Parton? And hopefully you all know. <laughs> she, she is the lady who sends me books. Ah, uh, yes. See, your students will have grown up with the Imagination Library, right? Uh, and I know that my, my daughter got all of the books mailed. My son did too. He's yeah. 12. And then you want to ask them, why is she famous? And they might say the exact same things that you just said just now. Um, what comes to mind when you think of Dolly Parton? Uh, and then here's the important question. Why is Dolly Parton important to Tennessee history? She's from Tennessee. She's from Tennessee. Where is she from? Severe. Severe. More specifically? Pigeon Forge. Pigeon Forge. Pigeon Forge. Yeah, Pigeon Forge. And why is she, but why did she originally become famous? Not because of the Imagination Library. She was a, she was a singer. A singer, songwriter. Yeah, singer, songwriter. Let's be, let's be uh, accurate here. She wrote her own songs, which nowadays is getting less and less of a, of a thing. Um, and she wrote songs that have gone on to be um, very famous. She's definitely a very uh, recognizable person, and she knows it, and she's worked very hard uh, to have a presence. Okay, so this is how the lesson idea in the newsletter starts off. Uh, she performed at the Grammys this year. I don't know if anybody heard that, um, but she, she did this medley, and so this is kind of your uh, way to get students kind of into the lesson. But yeah, that's, that's kind of something that you can show at the beginning if you have the kind of students that you think may have uh, watched that particular moment. Um, and so, but now the song that we want to focus on is Code of Many Colors. And uh, we are going to talk about the meaning of the lyrics. And we're going to break down the song as a historical artifact. So before we listen to it, I'm actually going to pass out an analysis sheet. Um, this is adapted from one that is off the Library of Congress. And read through the questions and just think about them. You're not going to answer them the very first time you listen to the song. So the very first time you listen to the song, just listen to the song. And then I'm going to pass out a lyric sheet and play it again. Because sometimes your students will need a lyric sheet to even if they can understand all the words that she's singing, it just kind of helps when they're reading and listening at the same time. And, and then we're going to be returning to this and filling this sheet out later. I like for them to think of songs as primary sources. And even things that are not very long ago in this span of human memory can be considered historical artifacts. Uh, Dolly Parton is alive of course, but, she, but her songs you can consider historical artifacts um, and that have, uh, that have meanings that you can analyze. And then of course you can use her as um, a personality to talk about uh, Tennessee and kind of its importance on the national stage. So what does she talk about in the song? What is this code of many colors? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a box of, you know, rags. It's rags that her yeah. mom, it's saved together. She, Coat made from rags, her mom made. And what's the larger message of the song? That it doesn't matter. You, you are in your own mind. You can, you can be rich and poor at the same time. Like there's, there are things that there is nothing money can give you. Okay. I couldn't find the right words. <laughs> okay, I think I know what you're getting at there. In the lyrics, it says <laughs> that one is only poor only if they choose to be. Is what she. Yeah, and I, I'm sure that that's you know something that we could debate about for quite a bit. But as far as the song goes, like, do you think the song is a true story? I would think so, because I mean, you know, she came from nothing, like a very humble background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So, I mean, maybe even if it isn't exactly true, I think this is very true of the kinds of experiences that she would have had growing up in, in, in poor rural East Tennessee. So in a way, I feel like this is, this kind of source reminds me of like an oral history uh, where you're hearing about somebody's experiences from childhood through their memories. And you can't exactly trust that everything's accurate as portrayed, but the whole overwhelming kind of truth that it's talking about is something that these people definitely experience. All right, so we're gonna go back and we're gonna listen to it uh, one more time while you read along, and then this song will be stuck in your head the rest of the weekend. You're welcome. <laughs> so now I want you to go ahead and fill out the Thinking About Songs as Historical Artifacts worksheet and then we will discuss. Now of course you can use that three column just regular analysis sheet for any type of primary source but this one is uh, geared more towards this particular format so might be a little better to use. All right let's go ahead and discuss these. So looking at the song, responding to the song, and thinking about history are our three different ways of tackling this. So we'll start off with looking at the song. Lyrics, what people, places, and events are mentioned. Mama. Mama. That's a good country song right there, right? Other kids. Joseph. Other kids. The other kids, Joseph from the Bible. Herself. It says, it doesn't say, yeah. my name says me. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, events. We going to school. Yeah, being laughed at at school, her mom making a coat, yeah. Um, okay, so about the music. What do you notice about the music? How would you describe it? It's very slow, but kind of rhythmic, especially because it's a guitar. Yeah, you hear the, the rhythmic guitar, yeah. Okay, what else, how would, else would you describe it? This might be something uh, that kids have trouble with. They don't really know. You don't usually describe how music sounds. It's like minimalistic, just her and the guitar. Yeah. What's it called? Acoustic. 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 Minimalistic. What else? I'd say it's kind of melancholy. Yeah. yeah. Well, because it's a very serious thing. Okay. It's not, it's not fun. Mm -hmm. She's remembering something that was hurtful. Mm -hmm. But also very... It's a very special oh, I memory. Yeah. I didn't see I didn't it as hurtful it. either. I didn't see it as sad. And okay. How did, how did you see it? Like I wrote down, remembering hard times later more fondly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like when you look back, it's like, oh, this made me actually, now I think about it in a fond way instead of a sad way. Tough times. Okay. Well... Like I was rich even though I was poor. Okay, so it was a profound experience for her, and but you can tell that in the the, the music itself has is lends itself to kind of a more serious topics. All right, um, responding to the song. So, what are your personal reactions to the lyrics? It's really heartfelt because of her mom sewing that out of love and blessing it with a kiss. Like I just love all those pieces yeah. that she talks about. Just how much she's and like what what he was saying was. The, the, that's the memory that's sticking out to her. You know, she talks about more about that than the kids making fun of her. Mm -hmm. You know, like she does mention that, but I mean, that theme with her mom sewing it out of love for her. Yeah, I know. Like, I was almost like, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was very appreciative because I woke, I grew up in a very, very poor family myself. We, we lived on welfare for most of my life when I was a kid. So when she talks about that kind of stuff, I had hand me down clothes and you know, army surplus food most of my life when I was a kid. So I really appreciate the lyrics because it speaks kind of like, I have a coat of many colors, but the yeah. same kind of situation, so. Yeah, yeah, you might have a lot of students who come from very poor backgrounds. Um, hopefully they all have such loving moms, but that might not all be the case. But just the, the idea that you don't want to worry for your children, but you do know that they're going to get into a situation. Sometimes there's just that situation where kids just don't understand. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. she feels like this is the world, but kids who have never been in her place don't understand that it has such meaning. Yeah. I think it's there's a lot of colloquialisms in it as a person who's not from Tennessee. I mean, I get it now. I've lived here long enough. But yeah. Like what? 
um, britches. Mm -hmm. And Ma, like, I get that mama obviously means mom, and I'm not saying people wouldn't understand that, but that, like, where I, I don't know anyone that calls their mom mama. I do now, but yeah. growing up, I wouldn't have. Right. I would have known what britches were, but I would have never heard a person not in a movie say it. Yeah, not in a movie. It just, the opposite of that is, is I never grew up hearing anyone call them mom unless they were mm -hmm. mad at them. Yeah. <laughs> I thought the, the connection with, like, the Bible would be in, like, a Southern mm -hmm. thing, too. And the like, blessing yeah. it with a kiss. Yeah, yeah. very yeah. much. A, very Southern. Yeah, so it has that kind of religious undertone. So what emotions might this song produce when song are played? Missing family. Yeah. It's kind of an empathy. Hopefully you will feel empathetic towards this, this person. Humbleness. Yeah. Maybe, like, appreciative. I mean... Appreciative. Who, so, who, who sews their clothes now, you know? I mean, yeah. Even. How many of us are loving our moms right now? Yeah. <laughs> or maybe missing them a little bit because they're not around anymore. Yeah, my mom just died and she never made me a coat like that, but she sewed me a lot of other things, so. And also just to think about how, you know, famous, you know, Dolly is like, this is where she's come from and, and look at all of this, you know, amazing success that she's had. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of just looking at that and thinking, you know, it, anybody can, can do the same thing. It's kind of inspiring because, yes. you know, you, you grow up in a, a home that doesn't have much. You don't really think much of yourself. Your dreams are just like too far away to reach because you got no resources. And then you see someone like her who got that background and has become successful. And she's speaking not just because she's successful, but she's speaking to where you are mm -hmm. at the time you can say, well, I can be there too. So it's kind of an inspiring song in that way. And also, I mean, she can sing about anything she wants to. She has, you know, this platform. She can write about anything in her songs, but she uses her own humble background to, to tell everyone what it's like. Uh, people who might have no connection whatsoever to that kind of lifestyle or that kind of place. And so the fact that she's, she's getting famous talking about these very humble origins, like the way that Loretta Lynn did, you know, is, is, uh, is, is very kind of genuine. Okay, so thinking about history now. So why do you think she wrote this song? Because it was special to her. Okay. And it's telling her story. Telling her story? It is a bit of a time capsule. Um, I think it shows how much rural poverty has changed. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like a lot of where it was very common for in rural poverty people were making clothes. Um, it seems today that that's not as practiced as, as far as like s physically sewing the clothes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of like a goodwill situation or a hand-me-down situation, not uh, I think the, the art of sewing clothes is kind of gone by the wayside to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that is, I don't know that she wrote it with that intention, but I do think that it, it's a product of, I don't, that was not the right word, but. Yeah, no, it, it, it does show the way that things would be different now if you were to write this song now. It kind of goes to the idea of why do you tell any story from history? Like I, as a history teacher, I always try to teach takes my history so it has some kind of connection to you. I mean, you're talking about Alexander the Great. It's kind of hard to get the kids to connect to that. But if you tell a story about your own poor background, which is a history story, it's a story, but it inspires the students. It gets them to think about themselves and what their future and and, and it kind of that's what hopefully underneath what we do as history teachers that that same theme relies in that we want to use a story from history to somehow motivate one of our students or more than one of our students to make a change in her life. And I think that song is, I think maybe that's why she wrote it. Mm -hmm. It's not just to tell her story, but to inspire others to do something about where they are. Or even to share their story. Mm -hmm. And I think to also to share the message that it's not about money. Yeah. You know, that, that love made her so rich and, and her mom is love. Right. So she sharing that, that, that piece of message, yeah. Um, what clues in the lyrics? Just the, the, you know, back to the first, the first line, back through the years, I go wondering again. She's obviously thinking about what has already happened. Yeah. So for what audience was the song written? Audience is always an important question that students just like, whoosh, they don't think about themselves as an audience. They don't think about 
who the audience was, and especially when you have like fifth graders, eighth graders, who are reading these documents from American history and they're really struggling with them. It's like, well, you know what? They weren't written for you. They were written for educated older men, probably. So, you know, think of, think of the audience. Probably common people. But yeah, this audience obviously is a little different. So common people. She could have been writing to people that were still in that type of rural poverty. I don't know exactly what year it was written, but. It looked like 1979 was that, 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 rec that video. I think it said 1979. I remember I had the album in 1990, like the, the vinyl. Yeah. Um, so she wrote it for people in those circumstances. She wrote it for common people. She's got universal themes in the song, even if you don't directly relate to that specific situation. She talks about love, family, struggle, or perseverance. Those are things that universally, if you're a person, you can relate to. So it was written. Yeah, for everybody? Yeah, yeah for everybody. That's a lot of Christian message there. OK. Huge Christian message. So written for people who probably more um, applicable to a Christian audience. Maybe just anybody who needs to understand that, you know, it's not as bad as you think. Like, you don't, it's, it's not about what you don't have. It's about what you do have. Okay. And what lyrics stood out to you most in the song? Pick at least two pieces in the song. I liked how she said, the love mama sewed in every stitch. Mm -hmm. You know, because sewing a stitch is just a physical act. It doesn't really have an emotion attached to it, but... The fact that she did it and the motivation behind it is what she's really talking about. I think that's a lot deeper than the act of just sewing. Uh, and so I think that's a pretty powerful lyric. Yeah, and it's, it's actually like little repetitive acts like that that actually, I mean, there's a reason why those are used as therapy and there's a reason why those things are used for meditation is because you can kind of connect that with like a wavelength in your brain. Like that's why you have rosary beads, you know, for Catholics, you're like, you're doing the same thing over and over again. This is why you might like copy out a word over and over again. So in a way, this is kind of uh, like a religious ritual uh, in, a, in a way, like you're sewing the love in with the stitch. It's the act of doing that. So it, it does kind of tie it in, I suppose, if you think of it that way. But, but yeah, it's, it's a very nice w uh, turn of words, the way that she wrote it. Other ones? I like the, the one is only poor, only if you choose to be. Like, you can overcome anything. Well, I have a problem with that because I do think there are a lot of people who wish they could choose their way out of poverty. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's I, I understand the message, but I, I also don't want this to be like, you know, let's look at poor people and say, well, you're only poor because no. you choose to be. So, so yeah, I mean, I would just like have that little caveat. And I don't want to rain on your parade that or there, anything. But. That there is opportunity out there if you look for it, for the most part. But, but, the, but the idea is it's not, she's not talking about like, like money poverty. Yeah. Well, she's talking about attitude of poverty, yeah. not, not the yeah. physical poverty. Right. Uh, some people will choose that their poverty and just accept their fate and just stay that way forever because their attitude says I'm a victim or whatever and I'm just nothing's going to happen for me. But other people say, well, I'm poor now, but I'm not going to be in the future, and that's a different attitude. Well, I don't, I don't think this has to do with money though. You can have all the money in the world and still be poor. Yeah. Is, are you poor in love? Yeah. She was looking at her blessings in her life and seeing that that was more important than a financial aspect. Right. right, right. It's just there's a there's a whole lot of like rhetoric about about, about people being poor and it's being their own fault and that kind of thing. Well, maybe like in terms of like certain things. It's right. a, it's about mindset. Mindset and um, your relationships with people. Yeah. Yeah. I just like that it can be interpreted so many different ways. That one line can yeah. be interpreted to kind of be inspirational. Yeah, and I do feel bad for people who maybe didn't have good relationships with their mothers, you know, reading this kind of thing, because it does kind of have the mother as the archetypal uh, source of all goodness and love um, and, 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 and always grounding you in what is the most important thing. And so... Um, I think Mama, you know, even though for her this was autobiographical, that it there might be some other person too that maybe provide that for people. Um, so, so yeah, there's there's a universal way that you could read this, but it's it's her own personal story too. Okay, 
Now, the way in which this lesson plan ends is by giving the students a little creative project to do. And I'm not going to pass it out, but this is the rubric that our graduate student created to go along with how you would grade such a project. And basically, uh, she has them create presentations about Dolly Parton's life and her contributions to Tennessee uh, culture. And so she should suggest you could do a skit, um, you could act out the song, you could write your own poem or, or do your own song, or maybe like take the lyrics and, and put them to a different tune. You could do a drawing, um, all sorts of things like that. So I think it's kind of neat to have a creative project to go along with a creative song. Uh, and, and, and it's always our grad students that come up with those ideas. But it comes with a lot of links because the Library of Congress actually has a presentation about the life of Dolly Parton, and it's called Dolly Parton and the Roots of Country Music. It comes with these articles and essays, so it talks about Locust Ridge. She wasn't actually from a town, you know, she's from outside of a town, so that's where uh, she was from. And there's also a timeline which is kind of nice uh, about her life and about her um, career and her different, you know, she worked with Porter Wagner and that's kind of who gave her her first break. Um, and then there's this larger kind of country music timeline, um, which is, I always like timelines. I know we're trying to de-emphasize the role of chronology, but I think that students really need a grounding in what happened when and in what order. Uh, before they can really understand things. And then, you know, um, articles uh, about music, different kinds of music in a different uh, presentation that are cross-referenced here uh, so that you can read about these different genres of music. And so this is another way that you can take a Tennessee example and talk about these larger national trends and how Tennessee music actually contributed to the larger culture. Uh, and then, of course, we have a, a biography of Dolly, who, goodness, she just turned 72. And then her discography, which of course is quite extensive. This woman is a hard worker. Okay, so, uh, and, and then there are some other uh, sources that you can have them look at, and of course, her role in the Imagination Library speaks to her another way that she's important culturally. Uh, in, this started off as a Tennessee program, but now it's across the nation. It's like in several different states, I believe. Uh, so that you can, um, you can go in this direction if you wanted. Um, and the Library of Congress even uh, talks about it in, in this news release. And, um, but, she was, this is uh, last year, she was, this is in the lobby of the Thomas Jefferson Building at the Library of Congress, where she's reading from a book. Uh, and so this kind of talks about, it was her 10, 100 millionth book. That, um, that's quite a lot of books that have been given out as part of this program. So that might be um, a really nice direction to go in, especially if you want to work this into like an English thing. Okay, now I'm going to show you where you can find these things online. An unfortunate thing about our website, since we had to change platforms, is that we lost our Google search box. I know there's a search box here, but it's just not as good. Uh, so I recommend that you browse the tabs before you do searching. So here's our homepage. Our most recent newsletter that y'all were just sent uh, is a History in the Movies, Volume 3. And uh, then, of course, our upcoming workshop schedule. And then here are our new things. We have a brand new Cold War lesson plan that was uh, made for us by a teacher. This was just posted yesterday, Jennifer Lang. Uh, in Hickman County did this really cool lesson plan and she was um, she was inspired by this lesson plan that Ethan did for us uh, using veterans workshops and uh, he's the one who did our agriculture lesson plan um, so this is looking at the um, 
the, the Veterans History Project uh, at the Library of Congress. Okay, and then we have a, a World War II primary source set. Now, for Tennessee history stuff, first of all, under our tools for educators, we have themed guides. Okay, it's under primary source sets. We have grade level resource guides. These have all just been recently updated because, well, we have new standards, right? Um, and what I also want to say about the new standards, that just about everything that we do is trying to fulfill social studies practices. That is something that we just embed in all of our workshops. So the fifth grade resource guide just recently updated is going to be going uh, through all of those standards and showing you what resources there are at the Library of Congress website that you can use to meet these, whether it's a, a photograph, whether it's a blog article written by somebody who works at the Library of Congress uh, with teachers, whether it's a primary source set, a lesson plan, a handout, uh, whether it's one of those features from America's Story or Today in History, um, anything that has to do with these different topics, uh, we have gone through, even Tennessee Encyclopedia entries, um, so you can see that's, that's quite a bit, uh, and that's to, some of, some places have actually stopped buying textbooks and are using instead just a lot of different resources, and they're using some of our resources to kind of teach through the curriculum, and so that's, this is one way to do that. And that's, and that, I'm sorry, and that's under the tools for educators? I'm sorry, it's not. That was my mistake. It's under primary source sets. I get confused because we call them resource guides, um, but they started off life as primary source sets. Um, and you can see that we even have a um, primary source set tab for Tennessee history up here. So if you click on that, uh, it's because we pretty much try to find Tennessee examples no matter what we are doing. So just about everything has some sort of Tennessee tie-in if we can make it. Now, not everything. I just did a lesson idea about the movie version of Henry V and the Battle of Agincourt in the Hundred Years' War. That has nothing to do with Tennessee, right? But, uh, but when we're talking about the civil rights movement, we're gonna be highlighting the things that happened in Tennessee. When we're talking about women's suffrage, and we highlighting the leaders that are from Tennessee. And so uh, that, you know, we're the Tennessee program for teaching with primary sources. That is what we are going to do. Now, the Dolly Parton comes from a newsletter and you can guess which one, right? Right? Women's history? Yes, thank you. We actually did her under women's history because, yeah, that's why. That's kind of where she belongs. Yes. So we did one in March on women's history, looking at um, Madam C.J. Walker. Um, here we go, here's Dolly Parton. So this is the, what you just did. Uh, here's a women in agriculture, if you wanna teach more about that theme. Now we did one uh, in April on Tennessee landmarks, which was a lot of fun. Um, we each of us picked something we thought was a fun landmark and did a lesson idea on it. So there's one on just the Mississippi River, uh, Ray County Courthouse, which of course is where the Scopes trial was held, um, musical landmarks, which is the Ryman Auditorium, Stax Records, and Sun Studio, uh, and Wynwood uh, State Historic Site. And then there are just like a few more that we always put on page four. So that's a really good Tennessee themed one. Oh, by the way, uh, in the American Revolution one, there is one on the Battle of Kings Mountain where the Overmountain men that Dr. Busey was talking about went to fight in this battle. And there's, um, there's a, a worksheet with, uh, that, that is included with it, um, George Washington's reaction to the battle. So that's something that would go along with that pretty well. We have several women's suffrage ones. Local history. Now, local history for us is Tennessee history, naturally. So we have tent cities. I know somebody put tent cities on a post-it note. Um, so here's one about that. 
um, free blacks in antebellum Tennessee. And this is the thing about Oak Ridge that led to the lesson plan on Oak Ridge that I told you about. So um, that lesson plan is going to be under U.S. History Reconstruction to Modern America. And then if you look on the tabs here, it's going to be World War II. Choosing the Secret City, the Creation and Importance of Oak Ridge, Tennessee. That's uh, the one that I was telling you about. Here's the, the, the man who was talking about his experience. It's pretty cool. Um, the, what's the word expansion? Tennessee's Western Frontier that also talks about the Cumberland Gap and Daniel Boone and those early maps. That's here. Um, we have one on Tennessee presidents. Uh, we have one on the Trail of Tears, and of course, Civil War. These are very much, uh, some of them are very much Tennessee related, of course. Now under Tools for Educators, we have these different themes, uh, which is basically saying we've, we've looked through the Library of Congress website and there's tons of things, uh, tons of different collections and other kinds of videos and things like that that have to do with this topic. So this is a good way that if you want to find the primary sources yourself, you just need some kind of direction in which to look. Uh, this is what those are for. We have all these analysis worksheets and we're adding more to them. We are just like shamelessly stealing them um, from a lot of different places and adapting them for our use, but with crediting, of course. But the thinking about songs as historical artifacts is right here. And this is what it looks like when you print it out from the Library of Congress. See? Okay, so what I want to do in the little bit of time I have left is show you on the library's website where there are some collections that are really good for finding Tennessee specific primary sources in. So I'm just going to take a moment to show you what some of those ones are. And um, I'm just going to, I'm going to go to digital collections. Right away, these things here are probably the best ones. So we're going to just go through each of these. This Historic American Building Survey, the acronym is HABS. Uh, and this is something that this started off in 1933 as a New Deal program and is actually still going today. It's really great for documenting all sorts of historic structures across the entire country. And because it just has so many things from every single state, um, you can go to more locations and you see it has 426 properties in Tennessee. So you can click on that and see what kinds of things that they have. Because this is a great way to do local history too. I guarantee you there's something in your county here. Uh, and you can always just search within this collection uh, your town name or something like that. And, and find it in there. So that's a really good collection to find Tennessee specific primary sources. Chronicling, Chronicling America, this is all the historic newspapers. And they are adding more and more every single day. Um, Cause this used to say 1789 to 1922 and now they're up to 1963. But you can go to look and see Tennessee. So how many, actually let's look, all digitized newspapers, show all digitized newspapers. You can download the complete list. Um, so you can actually search for where the Tennessee ones are. These are, some of them are from really tiny towns like the Bolivar Bulletin. No offense, Bolivar, you're adorable, but still, you're small. Uh, up to Knoxville, you know, Carroll County, Democrat. Uh, Clarksville, of course, you have your Nashville papers, uh, Greenville, Knoxville, of course, uh, no Murfreesboro stuff yet. Um, but uh, from all parts of Tennessee, there's, there's lots of these, and they'll give you the date range and that kind of thing. And some of them are papers that morphed into something else at a certain time because newspapers tend to change a lot over time. But the cool thing is, is they'll actually kind of, if you go to the page, They'll describe to you the history of that paper, which is good because sometimes they'll like tell you, oh, this is a Republican leaning paper during the Civil War. 
so you know what side they're on, or this is a paper that was, you know, Jeffers, uh, uh, your um, Jeffersonian Democrat leaning kind of thing, or Whiggish, or that kind of thing, and so that's kind of fun. Um, but yes, just like all these newspaper articles talking about daily life all across the state, uh, very good. Uh, in terms of finding things for your students to look at. And then here's the collection that has all the TVA stuff, all the Great Depression stuff. I'm just going to, I mean, the thing is, if you search Tennessee in here, you're going to not only get things from towns in Tennessee, you're going to get stuff that has to do with the Tennessee Valley, Valley Authority in other states, because Tennessee Valley Authority is also in, like, Alabama, thanks to Muscle Shoals and stuff like that. So you might want to be a little bit more specific. So, um, like, if I write Murfreesboro, look at this. You know, what's funny is that somebody actually, <laughs> we have this uh, Facebook page for downtown dwellers in Murfreesboro, and somebody used this, somebody posted this as the cover page today for that Facebook group. And I'm like, I know that picture. I've seen it a million times. This is somebody um, with the Farm Security Administration. I think it's Ben Shaw. Ben Shaw, yeah, going through Murfreesboro, like all these other little towns, Maynardville, Huntington, all these places, and just taking pictures of like daily life during the Great Depression and during World War II. And so again, really good for local history. And some of them, uh, like really iconic, like a lot of these Rosie the Riveter pictures were taken at Volte National Aircraft Corporation in Nashville. And then there are some pictures of like troop maneuvers during World War II where they were training troops down like near like Tullahoma and things like that. So like these things that you think about as part of our nation's history, but like scenes from Tennessee that are uh, talking about those. Um, and then the last one I just wanted to show you real fast. Uh, well, cities and towns, Civil War maps. Now we know that a lot of Civil War stuff took place. But these maps, these Union soldiers came in, these engineers, They'd never been to Tennessee before. It was very important for them to know where stuff was in Tennessee. They made incredible maps. So if you're looking for period maps, uh, look, look at the Civil War ones. They're often really fantastic.